a bit and to win a little bit of time because of uh, Dan Fliss, which will not be here. And so now I ask the uh, organization, do we have now the talk, the video talk of Professor Piero Nicolai? I think they are still looking for the talk, so we wait for that. And in the meantime, we start with uh, Professor Eric Wang, his talk about complications and how to avoid them. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Here you go. Thank you so much. Well, thank you guys uh, for allowing me to come, and uh, thank the organizing committee and, uh, and our chair people for this opportunity. Um, I, in a way, is, you know, giving the complications talk is always a little bit humbling when you go back and look at the things that, um, that have occurred in your life and in your career. Um, and so uh, as I embark on that, I ask for a little bit of forgiveness as we go through some of these things. Um, but hopefully in the meantime of showing some of these complications, we can also discuss about ways that we can learn from them together and perhaps prevent some of these things as we move forward. Ah, so no disclosures. So one of the unfortunate things about surgery is that uh, despite our very best efforts, despite our very best intentions, complications are somewhat inevitable. And as much as we'd like to say that complications are all preventable, um, unfortunately, we all know that to be untrue. And then we also see this cycle where complications often lead to more complications and lead to more complications. So um, these opportunities to discuss in these open forums together, uh, ways that we can perhaps learn and prevent these things from happening, is the most important thing that we can do from them. And oftentimes when I talk to my uh, colleagues and to my trainees, the most important thing I tell them from a complication is for us to learn from it, to try to avoid it from happening uh, going forward. One of the most common ways that's been identified for preventing complications is using a checklist. So identifying ahead of time, usually immediately before surgery, what kind of things you anticipate or are concerned about uh, for surgery. And especially with increasing uh, subspecialization, this can become a, a little bit of a lost art. We get so used to doing the same things every time. So uh, within my team at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, we actually have a very specific uh, checklist that we use for cranial base surgery. Um, this is a little bit different than we use for rhinology. Um, in rhinology, rarely do we need um, high-dose antibiotics, but especially when we have an intradural uh, defect. Uh, in my institution, we choose to use ceftriaxone um, because this has uh, CSF penetration for our intradural cases. But um, increasingly, we still, even as great as our societies have been, both Europe, Asia, Americas, and beyond, um, we still don't actually know the optimum antibiotic regimen to use in our endoscopic skull-based surgeries. Uh, perhaps we're still doing a little bit of overkill. Uh, but one of the other things I often talk about, especially when my rhinology trainees are thinking very much about trying to minimize uh, blood loss in the nasal cavity and having a pristine view, is that actually skull-based surgery is sometimes quite different. Um, oftentimes, we're operating for visual preservation. And as such, those optic nerves are somewhat compromised. And in this particular case, we're actually trying to keep mean arterial pressures higher because you want to perfuse um, those um, vascular structures. So we talk about this, especially when we do things like macroadenomas. Another consideration is that a lot of these patients may already have pituitary dysfunction. And the endocrinopathies can that occur from it also need to be treated as a stress dose before we start to uh, begin. And probably the most, um, in addition to speaking about instruments that we'll talk about today, uh, we always uh, give an estimate of what we think our carotid artery injury risk is when we start a case. So in Professor Briner's case, I would actually say that that case is a little bit high. That chondrosarcoma had a higher than average uh, incidence, maybe up to 1% uh, in that kind of very difficult chondrosarcoma, multiple revisions, uh, near encasement, at least 270, 270 degrees of the carotid artery. And we would talk about that ahead of time. So our anesthesiologists are prepared. Because I think preparation and communication are some of the most important things towards avoiding complications. All right. So checklists are a little bit boring, to be frank. I think everyone is coming to talk about what are the things that happen in surgery that are problems. And, and these are the things I want to uh, cover over today. 
specifically spending half the time on reconstructive complications and then half the time on interoperative um, and then finishing with a little bit about carotid injury. Uh, here we are. So reconstruction. So unfortunately, despite all of our best efforts. But you know um, what? The, the catheter is that on. So does that mean it's Not sure what pressure? that is. Um, but uh, CSF leak still is our most frequent complication. All right, Although well, um, this has decreased tremendously in comparison deal. to the early days of endoscopic well, skull base surgery, today. it's still roughly about 10% and, uh, if you look. I know that in the literature you can find all sorts of different levels, uh, from all the way down to zero to as high as like 40 or 50. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with the convolution. We, we group all these things in endoscopic skull base surgery together from a small pituitary defect to a very, very large transclival defect. So it's a little bit difficult um, to truly assess what those rates mean, especially since, as we all know, if you don't have an intradural or you don't have an intraoperative CSF leak, it's very rare for you to have a postoperative CSF leak. So we're changing that denominator to make sometimes our numbers feel a little bit better. But this is kind of a, an, a fairly obvious study that we're part of, which basically shows complications beget complications. So if you don't successfully repair a CSF leak, then you have more complications, including intracranial infections like meningitis, encephalopathies, pneumocephalus, more operations, more length of stay. This leads to you know, um, things like uh, deep venous thrombosis from immobilization and overall very increased costs. So we, this is obvious, okay? We all know this, uh, but this study sort of has demonstrated that. So are there things that we can do preoperatively to help us prevent CSF leak? And I would say, actually, we have not studied this very well as a, as a specialty. Um, and so um, taking some cues from um, my partners in head and neck and um, in other reconstructive specialties, we actually began to look at this in our patient population at the University of Pittsburgh. So we actually focused on pre-albumin. So as you know, albumin is sort of a measure of people's nutritional status over approximately a six-month range, six-week, six-month range. Pre-albumin is much more specific. It actually says what protein stores are available to you, uh, to your patient, excuse me, um, within the, first, within the last two weeks. And so um, if you can measure that preoperatively, perhaps this can impact our wound healing. And since uh, endonasal skull base surgery very much depends on secondary intention wound healing, we thought that this was a reasonable thing to do. So over approximately an 18-month period, we recruited close to 100 patients looking for high-flow CSF leaks. So these are things with a pure dural break. And then we obtained preoperative albumins within 30 days of the uh, surgical intervention time. And we use this 20 milligrams per deciliter cutoff. This is often used in the plastic surgery literature, general surgery literature, to sort of be a cutoff between normal and low normal and normal. And uh, this group had a little bit of a higher relief rate, about 14%. But what you can see is in the multivariate analysis, um, pre-albumin is actually a very strong risk factor. So here, here in better summary, if you, if you have a low pre-albumin, your odds ratio of having a CSF leak is four times greater than if you have a normal pre-albumin. And that kind of makes sense, right? You need those necessary proteins available to have your skull base repair heal. And then when you follow that up, there were six surgical site infections. This is either flap necrosis or meningitis, which I'll talk about a little bit more. If, you're in the, if you have no infections, um, you have a fairly normal prealbumin. If you have an infection, you see you have a very low prealbumin. Now, what we haven't done is to follow up on this. This is actually still sort of in review. Is we're currently measuring this group of people who have low prealbumins and seeing if we supplement them, dietarily supplement them in the preoperative setting. Can we alter this risk of CSF leak? And I would encourage you guys to think about this as well. I think this is actually something that we can do ahead of time in the preparatory stages for our patients to see if we can uh, make a difference in CSF leak. All right. So um, there are other things that we talk about interoperatively. Um, excuse me. Um, the most common of which really is the use of vascularized reconstruction. That's just a picture of a flap. You, you guys all know how to raise a nasal septal flap, so I'm not going to cover that in detail. Um, this is probably the first study, and it's actually quite old now, um, that really demonstrated that large dural defects really have a much, much improved rate of, um, or excuse me, improved rate of not having a postoperative CSF leak if you use vascularized reconstruction. And uh, this has continued on. This is from um, 
the, uh, our ICAR document that was published in IFAR, um, uh, which I had a, a role in. And um, actually, this is one of the highest grades of evidence we were able to provide. So uh, when you grade evidence A through D, um, in, in surgery, it's very rare we have level A evidence, multi-center uh, placebo-controlled trials. But um, in level B evidence, this is probably our highest, um, supporting the role of vascularized reconstruction for skull-based defects. Okay? So this is obviously something that many of us do now um, and we're all very familiar with. One of the still the more controversial areas is the role of lumbar drainage or CSF diversion in the perioperative setting. And so um, this is actually now a couple years old, but this is actually our randomized trial from the Pittsburgh group um, here where we took uh, prospective data and um, essentially randomized patients to either getting three days of lumbar drainage. Um, this was a 10 cc lumbar uh, drainage for three days in the postoperative period versus not. And the way we conducted this trial, um, our inclusion criteria are pretty strict. You had to have an arachnoid dissection inter into a ventricle, or you had to have a dural opening of at least one by one centimeters, which we actually took a ruler out and measured. And the exclusion criteria were essentially if you couldn't get a drain. And um, the way this sort of worked is we did a uh, analysis, a power analysis ahead of time, and planned to have 212 patients. We actually had to stop the trial a little bit early because we saw a clear and significant a difference on one of our quality checks. And essentially, they were drained for three days. We measured anatomical subsites because we included all comers. And this is uh, from the manuscript itself. So um, we ended up randomizing 170, and we ended up stopping uh, the trial a little bit early uh, because of a clear difference between the two. Obviously, with only a three-day of lumbar drainage, we had no loss uh, to follow up, and then we ended up analyzing 85 patients. And what you can see here is this is why we ended up stopping the trial, is that if you had a lumbar drain, you were much less likely to have a CSF leak than if you did not have a lumbar drain. And that was the only statistically a significant thing uh, that differed between the two groups, which is consistent with randomization. And when you did a multivariate regression analysis, that still proves to be true, where uh, no lumbar drainage gives you an increased odds ratio of having a CSF leak for these large drill defects. So these are not cellar defects. These are large drill defects, um, which is approximately three and a half times greater than that uh, without. So one of the interesting things that you can look at, though, is when you look at these anatomical subsites, that it may be is, it's such that we don't actually use a lumbar drain in every subsite. And you can see that in this, uh, this supercellar region, where we actually have wonderful vascularized coverage with a nasal septal flap, CSF fleek rates are actually very low, and the need for uh, lumbar drainage is perhaps not there. And so uh, when you use a lumbar drain, of course, uh, it eliminates the subsite differences between the two. So, uh, and this is predominantly driven by the anterior transcribiform approaches and um, the posterior transclival uh, approaches. And so, as a reminder, these are not um, spontaneous CSF leaks with an encephalocele. These are almost all um, olfactory groove meningiomas and um, synonasal malignancies. So here's that subset data. And one thing you notice is in the supercellar region, because of the openings that are occurring from the neurovascular structures, the size defect is not particularly large and um, the difference between the drain is not significant. So for supercellular lesions, we do not use a drain. And I would say this is sort of the workhorse of skull-based surgery, cranial pharyngiomas, um, some uh, tuberculum meningiomas in our hands. I think this is a wonderful area, and we do not use drains in this particular instance. However, in the anterior cranial fossa, uh, when you look at, it was predominantly driven by olfactory group meningiomas, there was actually a pretty significant uh, uh, difference. The average defect size is 3.7, which is essentially the same size as a extended nasal septal flap. So the size of the defect and the size of the coverage are not overlapping. They're essentially equal. Um, and this is perhaps why we have uh, some more challenges. I will note, though, that um, with sinonasal malignancies, we don't always use a lumbar drain. And that's because, um, unlike a meningioma, where you have a cave at the end of the resection, and you almost have like a cistern or a space for which CSF flows, um, Sinonasal malignancy is often the frontal lobes will um, sink down into your defect. So perhaps that's another group you don't have to uh, drain. But when you do large olfactory groove meningiomas, absolutely we use a lumbar drain. And this is an area where we really uh, don't have much discussion. In the posterior fossa, we have our very highest rates of CSF leak, 
Um, it's a very difficult contour. Um, as you know, the carotid artery sits upright. Everything else you work with is behind. So you have a three-dimensionality to the uh, defect. The defects are actually very large. 7.2 centimeters is way beyond a nasal septal flap, actually, in coverage size. Um, if, you, if you go from a full transclival defect, and you are in the prepontine cistern. So very high CSF flow rates, and essentially they're more difficult to diagnose as well because they sink right into the oropharynx. So uh, this is a very challenging area, and we continue to find this to be our most challenging area. So uh, I guess in summary, where I would recommend for you is to at least consider using lumbar drainage in your transclival defects um, and your anterior cranial fossa defects, uh, specifically if you're doing things like meningioma. All right, well, what about some postoperative complications that happen, not just CSF leaks? Well, here's a, unfortunately a very illustrative case of something that can sometimes happen. Um, so this patient initially did very well uh, for their transclival approach for this very large uh, petroclival meningioma. And then two weeks postoperatively, no CSF leak, but very active signs of meningitis. Headaches, neck stiffness, photophobia, and a really bad smell. So unfortunately, as rhinologists, sometimes we have to encounter some of that sudden smells already, but this is worse than average, okay? And you can see um, that on the po immediate postoperative MRI, the amount of enhancement there is quite limited. So unfortunately, this is a scenario which we have encountered, it's not very common, where the nasal septal flap actually doesn't make it, okay? And this is a necrotic nasal septal flap where you really have to treat it as a wound infection uh, with uh, full debridement of the necrotic part. You can see that the fascial underlay grafts are actually intact, so there's not really CSF, but the adjacent structure to the meninges um, transposing all of that infectious stuff uh, really can um, be quite, uh, quite profound in how they feel. So uh, we went back and looked at uh, our incidence of nasal, uh, necrotic nasal septal flaps and found it to be about 1.2%, to 1 which unfortunately has continued to be true. Um, and uh, we compared this. And what you'll find is that unlike um, a normal situation, uh, the necrotic flap really presents with signs of meningitis without CSF leak. So no rhinorrhea. Um, and it typically happens when the flap actually um, becomes necrotic, which is approximately uh, one to two weeks after. Um, although they have signs of meningitis, you'll find that they're often in aseptic uh, meningitis and that they can't culture any bacteria from the uh, CSF space. And so um, what you're able to go back and look at is if you go back, if you're a group that tends to get very early postoperative MRIs, which we tend to do, you can actually find um, a fair lack of enhancement in most of these uh, patients. And uh, this was statistically significant when you compare that. And the really strong risk factor is prior endonasal surgery. And that's not particularly surprising. So as much as we love our vascularized nasal septal flaps, one of the challenges is that the pedicle tends to sit a little bit more anteriorly if you're working in sphenoid or clival lesions. And so there is a potential for it to be disrupted. And so essentially what we found is oftentimes that these um, have a very narrow vascular pedicle or very narrow remnant. Um, the way we manage this, as you see, is aggressive debridement, um, high-dose antibiotics, um, and then we tend to do a salvage skull-based reconstruction, oftentimes using a lateral nasal wall flap. Well, are there ways that we can prevent this rare but very sick complication from occurring? And so actually we started to look into this, and actually what we found is for these transclival defects, which have the highest risk, um, in fact, nearly all of our patients with flap necrosis were transclival defects, um, we could actually create a small um, posterior nasal pharyngeal flap that actually reduces the rate of flap necrosis. So um, as you can see from this, um, it is essentially based off the uh, nasal pharyngeal mucosa and the vasopharyngeal fascia, very similar to what we do for nasal pharyngectomy in ways. We make um, incisions um, along the anterior aspect, and you can kind of decide what that anterior aspect is. Um, but then uh, laterally, the incisions are made in the fossas of Rosa Mueller. And then uh, oftentimes using monopolar cautery, we dissect it right off the clival bone of the lower midclivus, and all the way down to um, foramen magnum. And this provides a shelf for which the nasal septal flap can sit. And so it takes a little bit of extra time, but actually once you get pretty facile at it, it doesn't take too much extra time. And uh, this extra flap still allows you to have adequate access to the clival bone if you need to remove it. 
um, but we find it actually provides a really wonderful shelf for which we can inset and um, help our nasal septal flaps separate from the oral pharynx for these transclival defects. So um, this is an option for prevention than how we can avoid it. The second thing um, that we often do nowadays, in addition to our vascularized nasal septal flap, hopefully this is working. If I have any uh, support, would anyone be able to play the video on this? Well, let's see. So um, one of the things that we don't often have assessments for in, um, in uh, using postoperative MRIs is how much vascular inflow you have at a given moment. And uh, fortunately, we actually have technology is now commercially available that can help us to truly delineate that and understand that. So here is me raising a nasal septal flap. And um, this is an extended flap for a transclival defect. Well, nowadays, actually with um, outside of white light uh, endoscopy, we can actually look at the vascular inflow to our nasal septal flaps. So endocinin green has long been used in flap surgery. For those of you who uh, also do some plastic surgery, um, you know that you can use them for a variety of, um, to, to determine where your flap continues to have vascular inflow. And um, so this technology has now largely been adopted into the endoscopic space as well. Uh, initially, we started to use this to help us uh, visualize um, essentially neurovasculature, you know, looking at our ACAs and looking at our superior hypophyseals. Um, and it's a beautiful tool for looking at that degree of angiography. But what we quickly realized is that we can actually use this to also look at our flaps and see how much inflow is in our flaps. So this is our normal reconstructive technique. We use a collagen uh, inlay graft. Uh, we use a fascial lata overlay graft. Uh, with a little of abdominal fat between the two transclival or two uh, paraclival carotid arteries, and then the nasal septal flap covering um, the remainder, or ideally all of the defect. Um, sometimes it doesn't quite get that complete coverage. Um, and so uh, once the flap gets inset and has been untucked, then we have our anesthesiologist uh, inject five cc's of endocinin green, and uh, using uh, these angiography you can actually assess the vascular inflow into your, um, into your flap itself. And so this one, everyone shows their best case, right? So I showed one of my better cases too, where uh, in addition to having uh, flow into the flap pedicle, you also have flow into the flap body. And um, this we correlated with the postoperative MRI, uh, and you can, uh, you can see the enhancement patterns. So, um, Indosinin green is not something controversial to use. I mean, I think it's FDA approved in uh, all the United States and in many countries. And if you have these endoscopes available to you uh, or trial them, I think um, there are many companies that uh, provide that sort of uh, technology now. It gives you the opportunity to look forward to that. Okay. So this is a postoperative complication you don't want to have. So this is the blind placement of a duodenal feeding tube, uh, a Dobhoff tube. Uh, through our transclival defect. Um, so you know how these patients often go to ICUs and other floors, and some of them, especially with transclival defects, can have some swallowing dysfunction or uh, need long-term feeding. And so this is a case where a very eager, um, eager intern uh, decided to pass that feeding tube without visualization and passed it right through our flap. So not my happiest day, I will admit. Um, so uh, we took this kind of quickly to the operating room, and you can see that um, probably better than I could ever do, uh, past the flap, um, past the tube, immediately behind the flap, all the way down <laughs> um, to the uh, oropharynx. And they were very happy with the uh, chest x-ray afterwards, which showed it in the stomach, uh, but unfortunately uh, through my flap. So you uh, never want this to happen. Um, so again, you have to have protocols within your hospital so that people recognize that these patients are a little bit different. They're not the same as every other ICU patient uh, or every other craniotomy patient. Uh, and this was actually a very uh, fortunate situation where uh, thankfully, uh, once, you, once we get all this out, you'll see that actually it passed it uh, right above the extra, uh, uh, the, the fascial layers and just behind the flap. So thankfully, no um, intracranial injury uh, 
Uh, we have another unfortunate case at Pittsburgh before my time where actually a patient had a feeding tube passed into their cerebellum and expired. So this is actually a very serious complication. So um, some of the patients take this to an extreme. This is one of my patients who decided to get a tattoo uh, so that no one would be confused that he should ever have a nasal tube. Perhaps this is a little too extreme for many of us, but um, it shows that uh, perhaps uh, you may want to at least advocate that. Within our electronic health record of our hospital system, we actually have an alert that comes up that lets people know. Um, but you may want to create some of those kinds of things as well. All right. So uh, moving on to intraoperative complications. I like to spend a little time talking about cranial neuropathy. It's not something we always talk about, um, but actually something that's fairly common in skull base surgery. Um, this is for chordoma, clival chordoma, which has a very notoriously high rate of uh, cranial neuropathies. Um, we have a new cranial neuropathy rate about 5%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, when we think about that for other skull-based surgeries, like acoustic uh, vestibular schwannoma or lateral skull base, if we had a 5% risk of facial nerve, we think about it a lot. And I often uh, think that the, unfortunately, cranial nerve 6 is our endoscopic skull base cranial nerve, uh, or similar to the facial nerve, uh, for our lateral skull base colleagues. It's the nerve that we encounter the most. And it is really because um, in, if you do transclival or transcavernous work, it, it exists in all of our layers. Um, there's the prepontine cistern portion, there's the Dorello's canal portion, and then there's the cavernous sinus portion. And all of those are very medial. It's our most medial nerve, and we're, they, all three segments are at risk. So we began to explore this population in our group. Uh, this is work published in the laryngoscope. Um, that looked at uh, patients who had endoscopic skull base surgery with high-risk pathology, so the adenoma had to have cavernous sinus involvement. Um, and we started to say, can we predict the patients who will do well and who will not do well? And, um, and we looked at this using an ophthalmologic rating system um, that uh, exists out there from zero to five. And uh, when we looked at it, you can see that actually the more segments of the nerve that are involved, of course, then the higher risks of having a new cranial nerve 6 palsy, um, that does not uh, improve. So overall, our incidence was 6% in this higher risk population. And um, there actually is a fair amount of recovery. So 65% of patients actually do improve. Um, and um, that recovery was significant depending on how their early postoperative cranial nerve exam was. So if they had a partial palsy, i.e. they could come to midline, they had an 83% chance of improving, while if they could not come to midline, their chances of improving were only 38%. Now, there is a very specific scenario where you can 100% counsel patients that they will improve, and that's the patients with delayed palsies. So you wake up, they wake up from anesthesia, you see them in the early postoperative setting, and they have normal cranial nerve motion of six, and then they develop a delayed palsy. And that's almost always from inflammation from our surgical approach or um, sometimes from our flowable packing that we use to control cavernous sinus bleeding. And all of these patients will recover in the follow-ups to the study that continues to be true. So while again, we have post-operative tests that can tell us how to do or how the nerve function will be, we then began to wonder, are there ways that we can predict interoperatively if their cranial nerve sex function is gonna be intact? So again, borrowing from our lateral skull base surgeons, we use something called a cartouche dissector. This is, I think, named after Jack Cartouche of the Michigan Ear Institute. And it is um, essentially a triggered EMG. It's a triggered EMG dissector where you can connect um, some sort of ground to the face, and then it sends an electrical signal in mini volts. And um, so we, uh, for these kind of high-risk cases, we'll actually put leads into the eyes um, you can see the uh, demonstration there. We have an electrophysiology technician in the room to measure, and then we can use this um, cartouche um, dissector to sort of do triggered EMGs. And so we found 26 patients from that cohort who had a palsy, and we looked back at their um, EMG uh, predictors and compared it to 30 controls. Um, so what you can find is, if you compare it to controls, um, the ones with palsies, they much more commonly had a normal free EMG, so something that triggered in the setting um, that electrophysiologists could find it. At the end of the case, uh, the lack of stimulation uh, was higher as in the uh, group without, uh, with a cranial nerve palsy, and they also had lower compound muscle action potentials. I know, saying this to a group of rhinologists, you have to sort of think back of what compound action potentials are, but you know, the little muscular firing, okay? 
So um, that was compare to control. But what we really wanted to look at were, can we compare the permanent versus the transient cranial nerve 6 palsies? And we actually were able to find some differences. The lower, if you had a, a lower compound muscle uh, action potential, so you can't fire with as much, um, or requires more energy for the muscle to fire, you're much more likely to have a permanent cranial nerve 6 palsy. And if you couldn't get stimulation at the end of the case, you're also much more likely to have a cranial nerve 6 palsy. So for those of you who have this technology available, I think somatosensory evoked potentials combined with electromyography can actually be a very helpful tool if you're dissecting in very difficult places. All right. Lastly, I want to spend a little time talking about vascular complications. Um, so this is probably our best tool, uh, endoscopic Doppler. These are very cheap, reusable. You can use them all the time to help us delineate where car the carotid artery is in some of these very difficult cases. So we have this on every set and every case. But what happens um, when you have an internal carotid artery injury? So skull base surgery, unfortunately, is always working around the carotid artery. Um, in high-risk situations, it's probably worth getting a balloon inclusion test to see what the patient can tolerate. Um, I actually don't think bypass is a, a reasonable alternative. I mean, even in the best bypass surgeon's hands, uh, this takes probably too long. So oftentimes we're looking at what can we do interoperatively for vessel, pre vessel preservation, or do we need endovascular control? Um, and I'm going to show you a few examples uh, of that uh, through some video. But the principles for all of these are actually follow the same. Um, you want to localize the exact site of bleeding. Sometimes that's really difficult when you have such a high flow of blood loss. Um, and then initially, you want to focally pack the site. You need to get arterial control to pack the site. And to be honest with you, you need to not, not overpack as well. You don't want to completely occlude that vessel until you're ready to do so. In some cases, if you have a small enough injury with enough time, you can increase your exposure. And if possible, you want to get proximal control. We need our neurointerventional colleagues in the setting. We need them to get us these very immediate postoperative angiograms. And I'll show you some examples of, of their key role. OK. So these are our 10 ICA injuries from 3,000 cases or so from the UPMC Cranial Base Center. So um, this is a chondrosarcoma. Uh, not quite as extensive as uh, Professor Biner's, but still uh, reasonably extensive. Um, and, um, and unfortunately, in this, we're going to have a paraclival carotid artery injury. And you can see that when the tumor sort of encases it in this setting, it's, it can be um, inadvertent. Um, in this particular case, it was a slipped instrument. Um, but you can see this very, very high flow uh, CSF, I mean, high flow blood, um, blood uh, leak. And we, so we are able to, again, identify the site of injury, OK? And then we focally control it uh, with cotton. Cotton is kind of an amazing substance in this regard, um, cottonoid patties. Now, um, I know that we don't always have the ability to bipolar seal off a vessel, but once in a while, if it's a perforator like this, a perforator injury, you can actually seal it off with a bipolar. So these are very small injuries. They look very robust. I, I mean, every carotid injury looks very robust. But um, using a multi-handed technique, you can carefully focally pack it and control that bleeding, OK? And then you can see that the rest of this now becomes cavernous sinus bleeding. You do not want to confuse the two. If you interarterially inject this flowable packing that we use, you will create a very significant stroke that is not, in, my, in our hands and to my knowledge, not really recoverable. And all these little particulates, as they, they're like thrombic emboli uh, throughout the intracranial system. So you really have to know that you have your arterial bleeding under control before you do any flowable packing. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. We've had two people pass from that, and it's a, it's a terrible, um, terrible phenomenon. And then we can use our Doppler here um, to sort of listen to the vascular integrity, and then immediately to angiography. Okay, so that's kind of the best case scenario if you can do vessel preservation. Here's another situation, um, a very large uh, sphenocavernous meningioma, uh, third nerve palsy. Um, here is the injury uh, to the right carotid, actually the more common carotid in our series. Um, it's always difficult to say. But the principles are still the same. You want to identify it very closely um, and then control it. In this particular case, it wasn't just a, a, a avulsion injury. This is actually an injury to the vessel itself. And so here we're using a single shaft clip applier uh, with an aneurysm clip um, and uh, use that to control um, the uh, bleeding around it. Um, and 
Um, you can see the aneurysm clip uh, sits, can sit quite well. It is a quite tricky to learn how to place them, um, but uh, you can absolutely learn how to place them. Unfortunately, we've done a few aneurysms um, and one or two that have ruptured, so we've gotten kind of good at that. Um, <laughs> And then, um, but the challenge is the reconstruction in this particular setting, because this aneurysm clip sits up and tents up your reconstruction. So in addition to um, the work we do around it, um, what we often find is that uh, we need to put some fat and packs of fat around um, that aneurysm clip, or else the flap will tend to be eroded through. And then you're really kind of in a pickle because you have this exposed clip into your um, sphenoid sinus. So, um, and a second or two here, after we get this uh, short portion done, it'll show, um, it'll show the reconstruction. But um, it is one of the more challenging aspects. So here we take some abdominal fat, pack it around um, the aneurysm clip so that it will not erode through. This is unfortunately a complication we learned from another complication uh, where we had an eroded aneurysm clip um, from an aneurysm itself. Um, and then that tends to work uh, quite well. So you can see here in the immediate postoperative angiogram that there's actually vessel stenosis, and that can sometimes push you towards going back. But there are specific scenarios where you can really depend on your endovascular colleagues. They actually thought that this was thrombus, and so we just gave the patient four days of heparin, and you can see the resolution on the postoperative DSA. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. There was a video here, at least when I looked in the speaker ready room. Well, I apologize. Um, I guess it's not there anymore. Um, but this is about, this is probably our tried and true technique where we take a muscle patch and instead of just putting cotton, we actually pack against the vessel with muscle. And that's not particularly tricky to do. We harvest um, either some rectus with a little bit of rectus sheath crush it so that you can release some of the calcium, and then you can place that right against the uh, vessel repair. Uh, so this is our series. Um, we did sacrifice two vessels, but we did have one post-operative death during this particular uh, study time, and that was, again, from the injection of that flowable material into the artery itself. Um, it's always a consideration to have proximal control in the neck. All of us are head and neck surgeons and are capable of this. Um, but I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to practice on an ICA simulation. Um, this is the one scenario that I always practice. Um, we do this at our school-based course at the University of Pittsburgh, if any of you have the chance at some point, again, to um, visit us, um, where we actually create a model uh, with a high-flow pump through a carotid artery and make a small injury to actually practice this, because there's so few opportunities to actually practice ICA injury. So with that, I'll close with this Chinese proverbs. While you cannot prevent the birds of sorrow from flying over your head, you can prevent them from building nests in your hair. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <clears throat>all the nasty aspects and gave a lot of insight of how to prevent them. If you have, if you have any questions, there are microphones on both sides of the uh, chamber, so if you'd like to ask any questions, please approach the microphone. There's, yeah, there are two questions. Thanks a lot for this great talk. Uh, you covered in, an enormous uh, uh, um, area. Um, I was wondering, when you, when you talk about the lumbar drainage, uh, how do you prevent uh, new encephalon uh, from, from, from the drainage? And have you encountered those, those cases, and how do you prevent them? Because when you, when you drain too much, it might suck up air into the uh, intracranial space, and we had some cases um, uh, and I was wondering what, what you're doing about those. So, thank you, Dr. Bates. Uh, that was a great question. Um, you know, we don't actually open our drains until we've completed our postoperative head CT. So we have a pretty good uh, assessment of what our degree of pneumocephalus is immediately postoperatively. Um, ideally, if you have um, the skull brace repair intact, 
we should see increasing resolution. Maybe not right away, but over time. Um, I think the harder scenario is if you don't have an immediate um, post-operative image to sort of know how much your degree of pneumocephalus, and then you're sort of questioning. But usually, unfortunately, the one time we had a scenario, as you're describing, was really our, our repair was faulty. Like, we had a, essentially a misplaced portion of our fascia, and we had a small conduit of air. And in that particular setting, for sure, you're right. I mean, it, it's definitely a risk. So you're really dependent upon your endonasal repair to be quite intact. Um, to, to use your drainage. Um, and as you point out, uh, it's, it's quite high risk if you don't, and you need to be uh, closely monitoring those patients if you choose not to. And we do actually use a fairly aggressive drainage uh, protocol. 10 cc's an hour is fairly aggressive, yeah. Okay. But I do think you need that, unfortunately. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor. Second question from Professor Yves Brandt from Coeur, Switzerland. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I have a question concerning the carotid injury. If you have an injury and you have a vessel control and pack it with muscle patch and see the vessel is patent, um, do you consider a follow-up because of the formation of pseudoaneurysm? Or do you have any indication for stenting in terms of preservation of the vessel? Wonderful question. Uh, absolutely. Um, one thing I didn't point out well that the professor here points out is that you are, uh, even if you have a very good immediate postoperative angiogram, uh, the risk of pseudoaneurysm development is not insignificant. Um, so uh, even with a good muscle patch, which I think is our best ch chance of preventing that, I think you're still obligated. Um, our protocol is typically to go back at 72 hours uh, after our carotid injury to get a second angiogram. Um, and in that particular case, we do use uh, covered pipeline stents if pseudoaneurysms develop. Um, I, I don't know what the European equivalent of, of that is, or if you use pipeline stents as well. They are technically a covered stent, but I think it's a little bit of a misnomer in that they're not actually 100%, you know, they don't have 100% integrity. They still have some small holes in them. And so we actually had one incidence where um, a pipeline stent was used, and they guaranteed us that it was going to be excellent. We took out the packing you know, at day uh, seven, and it rupt nearly ruptured into the field and occurred again. So that's absolutely a significant risk. Um, and you do have to follow up with serial uh, angiography. Um, we even will get a, um, some sort of non-invasive angiogram again at another one month after surgery in addition to the three-day three uh, three uh, angiogram. Thank you. Thank you very much. M maybe one more question from me. I apologize for putting you to the University of Florida. Uh, oh, it's I no know problem. you are in Pittsburgh. Um, you, you, you said that you do not perform CSF diversion or lumbar drainage in supracellular approaches routinely. What about when you have an open third ventricle, so you have a high flow situation in supracellular approaches, for example, for craniopharyngiomas? You put CSF diversion there? We, we do not. Um, and even when we go way into the third ventricle, um, actually, we've actually found that to be very successful. And I, I think part of it actually has to do with just relative dimensions. So, you know, craniopharyngioma, for example, um, your exposure is actually limited by your optic apparatus. You can, you can go more, you can open the dura more, but it doesn't really help you because you're working underneath um, the optic apparatus and the optic chiasm. So um, your dural defects tend to be somewhat smaller, and your nasal septal flaps are much larger. And so I think you have actually a wonderful amount of overlay, and um, so we've been very successful without. I know that other people still um, support their use in that particular setting. Uh, our data doesn't didn't reveal that, but I think it's not wrong to consider that. Um, but uh, we found in our particular uh, series, in our particular hands, that we're actually quite capable of getting away without in that particular setting. Um, now, there are some very specific situations where we'll place an external ventricular device, you know, if they have massive uh, hydrocephalus from their third ventricular um, tumors. Um, in that particular case, it kind of simulates what uh, Professor Brian was speaking of. Right, well, thank, thank you, you. again. <clears throat>